It's affecting you on a subconscious level. And by using it so frequently, you're being affected without you uh, knowing it. So the first effect, negative effect, is on the uh, individual self. The second negative effect is on society. Because what happens is, as I said, oftentimes people use technology as an uh, alternative means of communicating with other people. And, uh, you know, rather than, for example, going to a friend's house, people communicate via text messaging or through uh, chat rooms rather than actually communicating with other people. It makes us less inclined to be socially interactive. And uh, this is something that was uh, mentioned by a uh, writer over at the New Yorker magazine, a man named Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, he was analyzing, you know, a lot of uh, the uh, media commentators, they say that the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia and in Bahrain and in uh, these other places, they're all called the Facebook revolutions and they're all called the Twitter revolutions because people are using these devices to go out and to cause re revolutions. But he says, is that true? Are people really using these technologies to go out and to, uh, you know, cause these uh, protests? What he found in his research is that most of the people who went on these protests either did not have access to the internet or number two, if they did have access to the internet, it was so limited. So what he said is that the reason that these protests came about is not because of the technology, but it's the people that made these uh, protests, not the technology. But people often uh, forget about these things. And just to give you one final example, um, there was a study done at Stanford University where they asked uh, people, um, students, to uh, not use the internet, to not use the entire internet for a period of two weeks. So again, I said there was a study in Pennsylvania where the entire college did not use the uh, Facebook and Twitter for one week. There was another study at Stanford where rather than the entire college, they picked groups of students and they told them not to use the internet for a period of one, uh, for a period of uh, two weeks. And what they found is that there were many uh, students who said that they felt like they were socially isolated when they were not able to use the internet. Even though they're in college, even though they're surrounded by their friends, they, they said that they felt like they were isolated, like they didn't have anyone to talk to when they did not use, when they were not able to use the uh, computer. Meaning that the computer, internet technology has become so important in our lives that it really uh, causes these, uh, uh, inabilities of mankind to, um, you know, connect with each other on a uh, social level. So do I. So what is the uh, solution? What is the solution to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there, we're not like these people that We don't want to be the group of people who are in a state of ghafla. We don't want to be a group of these people. How do we avoid this uh, this problem? Well, um, you know, and as I mentioned, the uh, technologies, they facilitate our ability to uh, not connect with Allah because they preoccupy our brains with other things which are maybe less meaningful and less, uh, less um, you know, filled, filled with uh, meaning. So the uh, best way is, of course, uh, to, um, you know, reinfuse the uh, sacred into our day daily lives. And, of course, it goes back to reading the Qur'an. But when we read the Qur'an, we have to approach reading the Qur'an in a way that was taught to us by the uh, Prophet Muhammad I'm going to uh, recite to you two hadiths from Prophet Muhammad and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq because it's their birthdays that are coming up. And they tell us the solution for how we can avoid being in a state of ghafla whether we're in the 21st century, whether we're in the 5th century, whether we're in the 6th century, the solution according to them is reading the Qur'an. But not reading the Qur'an like we would read Harry Potter, or not reading the Qur'an like we would read the New York Times, but rather reading the Qur'an in the way that they've uh, told us. First of all, what does Imam Jafar al-Sadiq say? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says, مَنْ قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنِ فَهُوَ غَنِي وَلَا فَقْرٌ بَعْدَهُ وَلَا مَا بِهِ غَنِي Imam Sadiq says, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says, one who recites the Qur'an will be free from need from everyone and thereafter will not be in need of anything. But as for the one who does not recite the Qur'an, nothing at all will make him needless and he will always be in need of others. Meaning Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says that reading this Qur'an is your source of freedom. 
Many people, they develop these internet addictions because they feel like they need the internet so that they can survive. Like these students who said that for a period of two weeks when they weren't able to use the internet, they felt like they were socially alone. They felt socially isolated. Why? Because they become dependent on the internet. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says, read this Qur'an and you will be free from everyone. You'll be free from everything. You'll be free from everything that limits you. But how do we read the Qur'an? Well, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Recite the Qur'an in such a way that your hearts, that your hearts develop a love of it. And that your skin becomes softened by it. However, as soon as your hearts become indifferent, as soon as your hearts don't care, then stop reciting it. Meaning, when you recite this Quran, approach it with the expectation of being touched, and not being touched on an intellectual level exclusively, but being touched on the level of the, of the heart. You know, many people, when they read the Quran, they say, well, today I have to read... Uh, one entire juz. And so they'll read the Quran, blah, 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 and they don't understand anything. I had a uh, aunt in Iran, actually, so she would, uh, every day she would read the Quran, and then in front of her the TV was turned on, and then, uh, you know, whenever someone passed by her and said something to her, she would always be engaged in a conversation. So she would be involved in three tasks. She reads the Quran, watches the TV, and talks with you at the same time. time. Exactly, very, uh, very uh, great discipline, you know. But uh, this is what the Prophet is saying. Saying when you read the Qur'an, make it a special time. Have, maybe have a special area in your house where you read the Qur'an. So that when you're reading it, it's not like, oh, the last thing. Read one ayah. If, yeah, if, the, if, the, if the ayah, Yasin, uh, affects you, then just read that ayah and then close the Qur'an. But don't read uh, the Qur'an so that you're reading like 50 ayahs, but you're not understanding anything. Read the Qur'an so that you can understand one word and that one word affects your heart and affects your skin in such a way that you become affected by it. So really the ultimate way to avoid uh, falling in the state of heedlessness, in the state of uh, turning away from Allah, like is uh, mentioned in the eyes that I mentioned in the beginning, is to, uh, number one, recognize what it is that we're exposing our hearts to. On a daily basis, we're exposing our hearts to so much technology then the question becomes, how does this technology affect our hearts? Well, it affects our hearts in many negative ways, in addition to positive ways. To avoid being affected by the negative ways, we have to turn to the most positive stimulus to the heart, which is the Qur'an. It's like the uh, modern Lipitor. It's like the Lipitor of the spiritual heart. It will clear the uh, arteries so that your heart becomes free and filled with oxygen and not just decrepit and heart. And I just wanted to uh, close with this uh, last uh, story from uh, Rumi. Rumi has a beautiful uh, story in his uh, Methnevi where he talks about this uh, bazaar. So he talks about this bazaar where people sell perfume. And he says these perfume sellers, they become accustomed to the pretty smells of the perfumes in the bazaar because, you know, every day they sell the perfume. Well, one day what happened is a horse came into the bazaar and did his business. He did some droppings on the ground. So all of a sudden, there's this bad smell in the perfume area. So the, uh, the uh, perfume sellers, they didn't want to clean it because they're accustomed to only smelling pretty things. They're only accustomed to smelling nice things. So what they did is they invited this man whose only job is to clean horse droppings. They invited him to the perfume bazaar to clean the horse droppings. The man came to the perfume bazaar, and as soon as he came, he fainted. He became unconscious. Then when they woke him up, they said, why did you faint? This is such a pretty smell. He says, yes, I'm always accustomed to the smell of horse droppings. When I came here to the perfume bazaar, my, my uh, mind couldn't take this uh, pretty smell, so I fainted. So my point here, and Rumi was mentioning the story by way of saying, it's, you know, your body is, uh, d depends on what you accustom it to. If you accustom your body to perfume smells, then if you smell something bad, you will immediately turn away from it. But if you accustom yourself to the bad things, then if you smell something good, you don't want to turn to that good thing. So the point being, the remembrance of Allah is the ultimate perfume for the spiritual heart. 
technology in the form of, let's say, 20 hours on Facebook, this is a bad smell, which uh, if you accustom yourself to, you, when you turn to the Qur'an, you won't be affected by it. So that's why we uh, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our hearts, to connect our hearts with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to reduce our dependence on things which take us away from Allah. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, guide us to the right way. Let us close by reciting for two uh, sisters who are uh, feeling very uh, ill these days. And uh, inshallah Allah will help them uh, out. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-Mustadra iza da'ahu wa yakshifu su. 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 Thank you very much. No, stay here. First of all, I don't know whether uh, this, I can make this comparison when you talk about the heart. About the heart. Uh, I don't know whether I can make this comparison. Look at the computer. The computer has two parts. One is the hardware, one is the software. When you said the spiritual heart, probably the software operating system and all those things. We are dealing with just the hardware. And the libido that he said is cleaning the hardware. I mean, you have to allow us to law that final group. This is different, what he said. And I'm so glad that he mentioned it. Is there any question, anything particular, anything you want to add, you want to say something? <coughs> any, anybody? Anything? Uh, thank you so much again. I appreciate your kindness and your help. and. Uh, we never uh, have enough of what you are telling us. Uh, thank you very much. Salamat. Allah. 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 Allah